Welcome to Hope City Church. This is a place where you don't have to have it all together. Where it's okay to not be okay. We're all in the same boat. That's why we gather every Sunday, because we believe Jesus gives us a better way to do life. This is a place where we can connect and grow in our faith, where we are challenged to not settle for complacency. Where we pursue grace and truth with a desire to become more like Jesus. Our ultimate hope is to be a place where we bump into Jesus and experience His life-changing hope. This hope changes our families. This hope changes our workplaces and cities. This hope changes you, and this hope changes me. This hope is for everyone. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and jump in and get started with our teaching time now. Um, you, you ever have like one of those uh, oh crap moments? I can't believe uh, that just happened. Uh, I literally just had one of those 30 seconds ago uh, when Greg Griffin came up to me and he goes, hey, I just want to let you know, your mic was hot during worship and it was playing downstairs in the lobby and we recorded a video of you, of you singing and we are so glad you use your gifts teaching and not singing right now. I don't even know how to recover from that, but <laughs> man, if you came in and you heard me sing, I apologize in advance, all right? Um, the teaching hopefully will be a little bit better than my singing, but Hey, uh, this is a bittersweet day around Hope City uh, because, man, it's hard as we send Gabe and Madison on to what's next for them in ministry. But uh, on the other hand, it's really exciting for them and us as a church. And, and here's why I believe that's true, because God chooses to accomplish his purposes here on this earth through people. It's what we're going to talk about uh, today. And sometimes when, when he does that, it means leaving one place and going to another. It, it's why Hope City exists when our family decided to pack up and move across the country and leave a really great church and come here and start this church. And, and, and it's what God does when he moves a family like Gabe and Madison an hour north to stay within our, our, our network family. And here's what I found in almost 15 years of ministry, um, that any time God is moving people, it's because he's on the move. Anytime God's moving people, it's because he's on the move. He's preparing them and working in and through them uh, to, to kind of set them up for what's next in life and ministry and through their marriage. And he's also preparing us as a church for what he's going to do next uh, around here. And so while we're sad to see him go, man, I couldn't be more excited uh, for how they're responding in obedience to where Jesus is leading. Because I can tell you firsthand, it's really hard. It's really hard. But they're leaning in and they're, um, they're just following Jesus. And man, I couldn't be more proud of uh, the decisions that they're making in this. Uh, and man, if you have any questions around this, I just want to let you know I'm open to any conversation. So you can catch me afterwards or you can shoot me an email at adam at experiencehope.city. Uh, we're actively working on what it's going to look like for city kids moving into to next year. And I don't have all the answers for you yet, but I'll answer any questions that I can uh, as transparently as possible. But you may ask a question. I'm like, I don't know yet. Give me time and we'll get there. All right. Uh, but more than anything, I want to just say this again. Please, 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 over the next couple weeks, be sure to find Gabe and Madison and encourage them as they get ready to go. Let them know how much they mean to this community and that we're behind them as they take their next steps to follow Jesus and move up to Joplin, all right? Um, so today we're in this uh, series called Give Hope, and we're wrapping up this series today. And we've been looking at this question over the last few weeks together. How can we become the kinds of people and the kind of church that give hope away to everyone around us the same way that Jesus moved in our direction through Christmas to give hope to the world? And over these last few weeks, we've looked at how Jesus does this on an individual level and then with our families. Uh, we say with, with an individual, Jesus does this one person, one conversation, one interaction at a time. And then we moved into how does Jesus give hope to our families? And two weeks ago, we looked at this idea that, that as, um, as we trust Jesus to take care of us and those closest to us, our homes and our families become places of hope and healing for the whole community. And today, we're going to take a look at how does Jesus work to bring hope through the church to entire communities. So think, how could, how could Jesus work in Hope City to bring hope to all of Northwest Arkansas? And ultimately, when we talk about giving hope, it all starts here. It starts from a place of gratitude. It starts from a place of gratitude and understanding all that God has done in our direction. And, and, and when we know how much we have to be grateful for, like we can't help but be the kinds of people who give hope away to everyone around us. And, and man, as a church, we have so much to be grateful for. Uh, this is our last all-in baptism weekend of the year. And uh, we've got at least one more person going all in today to celebrate, maybe more by the time we get done with this today. Uh, but man, when somebody does that, they're saying, Jesus, I'm all in. 
I, I want the life that you have for me. I believe that you are who you claim to be, and, and I want you to work in my life to set me up to be the person you created me to be. And, and whenever we do this, I say this every time because I don't want to miss that moment. We're literally witnessing a miracle of God at work in somebody's life. The scripture tells us that when somebody goes all in and they're baptized, they're being transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. And, and, and that's something that, that we have to celebrate. I'm so grateful for that. Uh, over these last few weeks, I've heard so many stories too from you all on how God, God's working to restore your marriages and your families. Uh, I've heard stories of people who have found like personal joy and freedom from the dark stuff in their past through an organization that we do retreats with called the Crucible Project. Uh, I've heard how so many of you have trusted God with your finances in this season, uh, realizing, man, I I need to be more generous. And, And what you've told me is, Adam, God has made up the gaps in ways we couldn't even see coming. Like, like we put him to the test, and, and he was true to his promises. Uh, just last weekend, we had our local impact weekend with Shared Beginnings, where Hope City, you all helped serve hundreds of kids uh, that are going to have a, an amazing Christmas. Uh, and we're going to catch up more on that next week, but they're going to have an amazing Christmas in the way that you all serve. Like, I, I don't know if you know this, but the impact you're making on this community is significant. And then I've talked to family after family, even over these last few weeks, that have said, man, I've been, we, we've been looking for a church like Hope City for a long time. And, and people tell me things like this when they walk into this community and they meet you all. They're like, there's just something different about this place. I, I don't know what it is, but there's something different about this place. And, and I, I'm just going to be honest, uh, we're not that good, okay? We're, we are not that good. But God is. And what people are responding to in that moment is the presence of God at work in and through this church. And every week we show up in here, right? Like we're expectant that God is working like right here, right now, even as we gather. Man, as we look at all that, I just want to say we've got so much to be grateful for, don't we? And so out of that, we can't help but be the kinds of people who give hope away. And when it comes to Jesus' plan to give hope in our time, in our world, guess who he's entrusted that, that to? To us, right? And the idea that I want to look at today as we close out this series is this. We are Jesus' plan A to give hope to the world. We are Jesus' plan A to give hope to the world. There is no plan B. If our families or our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends at school, wherever we go, if they're going to experience hope, Jesus says, it's us. It's you and me. So how does this work? And if you're like me, that might sound just a little bit overwhelming, Because I go, man, what difference could I really make? Or or I don't know if I have enough to offer. But here's the reality. Uh, The story we're getting ready to celebrate on Christmas next week is the story that God is working stuff out in our lives and our families in this church in a way that's so much greater than all of us. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are now a son or daughter of a really good king who's entrusted you with a piece of his kingdom. And he's literally given everything in our direction through Jesus. And now he's asking us to represent who he is and what he's like to the world around us. And if you've even tasted just a little bit of the hope that that Jesus is offering, then he's asking us to be people who give hope. And here's the key. No matter how small it may feel, no matter how insignificant it may seem, everyone, everyone has something to offer now inside the kingdom of God. We are Jesus' plan A to give hope to the world. So how does that work? Well, if you have your phones or Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew 14 today, all right? So go ahead and turn there. Matthew 14, it'll be up here on the screens in just a minute. Uh, But as you're turning there, let me set this up a little bit. The story that we're going to look at today, it's actually found in all four gospel accounts or the biographies of Jesus' life. And I I want to give you just kind of an overview of the summaries uh, of the gospels or or the good news of Jesus that we find in the Bible. All, All of these stories were written down from the perspectives of eyewitnesses to Jesus' life. So what we are reading are literally the words of people who were there that day. Uh, Most of these stories were told like orally through the first uh, several years of the church, but eventually the the early church leaders were like, man, these stories, like they're really important and we need to write them down for future generations, including us today, so that we would have these stories to build our faith on. And so a guy named Mark wrote the earliest account of Jesus' life. He, He was a close friend of Peter. And so he wrote down what he learned from Peter, who was with Jesus. And then Matthew, who was a crooked IRS agent before he started like following Jesus, um, he, he wanted people to know that no one's ever too far gone. No one's too messed up. And so he started writing down his stories of Jesus. And, and then there was a guy named Luke who came in. And Luke says in his gospel that he wanted his good friend Theophilus to know with certainty the hope that he had in Jesus. And so Luke started going around and interviewing eyewitnesses to Jesus' life. Many believe he even interviewed Jesus' mother, uh, Mary, and and he wrote down these stories so that his friend could know with certainty the hope that he had. 
Hey, and then John was a guy that was with Jesus, and he outlived all the other disciples, and he came in last, and he goes, hey, I, I want to write down my experience with my friend Jesus so that you could, ha- you could know more and more about the hope that you have in him. And, and the whole reason behind these stories being written down was so that we could not only be certain of the hope we have in Jesus, but so that future generations could carry on these stories to give hope to the world in their generation. And so Hope City, in our generation, we are God's plan A to bring that hope to the world. So let's jump into this in Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. What what we're going to see is a glimpse of how Jesus wants to to set us up to live out that purpose. So verse 13 of Matthew 14, it says this, when Jesus had heard what had happened, hang on, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. He withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. And hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed, he saw such a large crowd and he had compassion on them, healing their sick. So what was it that Jesus had heard that it happened. Well, this story starts on the heels of two really significant events in Jesus' life. Uh, The first event was Jesus had just sent out his disciples, these 12 guys in pairs, uh, to tell the the, the region about his good news. He he had set them up to be his plan A to bring hope to the world, to bring to their homes, their neighborhoods, and their communities, wherever they go. The, The second thing that had taken place while these guys were on this mission trip was that Jesus' cousin and his really good friend, John the Baptist, had just been killed for his faith in Jesus. Uh, A king named Herod had John the Baptist beheaded. Like, like it's just brutal. And and so Jesus wanted to get away and have some space to process through his cousin's death. And he wanted to give the rest of the disciples some rest from this mission trip that they'd been on. But instead of getting some alone time, what's it say? What what took place? The crowd started showing up, right? Right? And when Jesus saw him, he didn't go, hey, guys, it's a bad time. I need you to give me some alone time for a little bit. No, it says that he felt compassion for them. And that word compassion, it literally translates, uh, you ready for this? To be moved in one's bowels. To be moved in one's bowels. And what that's talking about isn't like bad pizza or tacos that you had last night, and then it ends up in a crazy bowel movement the next day. Uh, What it's talking about is in Jewish culture, bowels were thought to be the place of love and pity. It's really weird, but that's just how they saw it, okay? So to help us understand this in our context today, I can't get past the poop joke, I'm sorry, but but to help us understand that in our our context today, have you ever seen someone in such a desperate situation or, or looked at your kids or your spouse and felt such overwhelming love for them that it literally like moved you to the core of who you are? Or have you ever felt so much love and compassion and tenderness towards someone that you couldn't even contain it? That's what this is talking about here. That, that's what Jesus felt towards the crowd that day. And Mark tells us that Jesus felt this way because the people were lost. They were desperate for hope. Mark describes them as sheep without a shepherd. And so Jesus felt compassion. And, and he welcomed the crowds in and he started teaching them and, and bringing hope and healing into their lives. And, and then verse 15 tells us that as evening approached, the disciples came to him and they said, hey, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. So let's send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy, buy themselves some food. And then Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. So think about this. After the mission trip, after John's death, and now this huge crowd th- showing up, the disciples are just kind of like over this moment. They're like, all right, Jesus, like that, that was good for today. We just need some downtime to hang and chill now. Um, you ever feel that way after a long day at work, or maybe uh, you hosted a Christmas party this week and all your family overstayed their welcome, and you're like, I just want to go to bed. Get out of my house right now. Like, I think that's what the disciples are feeling in this moment. And, and so they start giving Jesus some advice, which typically doesn't go well when we try to tell Jesus how to be Jesus. And they tell Jesus, send these people home. They, they don't have a lot. They don't have food. They've come a long way. We need to get them home before it gets dark, and they need to eat, which is kind of their excuse just to get the people out of there. And, and Jesus flips them on their heads, and he goes, you know what? You're right. They're hungry. You give them something to eat. Have you ever had a moment where you're praying for something for someone else? And then Jesus goes, yeah, you should be praying for that, but I have an answer for you. You do it. It, You're the answer to their prayer. See, often what we'll find is that we are Jesus' plan A to answer the prayers that someone else is praying. At verse 17, the disciples respond to Jesus and they said, we have here only a few loaves of bread and, and two fish. And this is where it gets interesting that, that all four gospel writers record this story because they're all recording it from their own perspective. 
Uh, Matthew and John, they were actually there that day, and Luke and Mark re- record these stories from the people who were there that day, and they heard the stories through them and wrote them down. And, and when you look at the story through the lens of all four gospel accounts, you get a fuller picture of what actually happened that day. Um, John, one of Jesus' closest friends, he, he records that one of Jesus' disciples, Philip, comes up, and he's like, Jesus, it would take more money than we can make in a year to feed these people. So, some scholars estimate that there were over 20,000 people there that day. And five loaves and two fish isn't enough for the 12 disciples, let alone this crowd of thousands who's gathered. And that's the challenge in following Jesus. We've talked about this before, but often Jesus will lead us to the places where the gap between where we currently stand and what he's asking us to do next or where he's asking us to go, it's too big. We don't have the the, the resources. We don't have the money. We don't have the energy. We don't have the time. We don't have anything else that we need to give hope in the way that Jesus is asking us to. Have you ever been there? Like these people are miles from civilization. They're lost and they're hungry and they're desperate for hope. And Jesus tells his disciples, could you guys just find something for them to eat? And the disciples have no way of providing something simple like food for these people. They they can't do what Jesus is asking them to do. Like what is Jesus thinking? Is he setting them up for failure here? Well, well, John tells us another really interesting detail in this story. Uh, We're going to look at John chapter 6, verse 8. It it says that another of Jesus' disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he spoke up and he goes, there's this boy here with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? So we talked about Andrew two weeks ago. He's Peter's brother who had left his family and his fishing job uh, to follow Jesus. And he comes up to Jesus and he goes, hey, we we found this little boy with these five loaves and two fish. It would have been the equivalent of like five crackers and two sardines. Like that's all he has. What's Andrew thinking? He knows that this is even close to enough food for for this crowd, right? And and let's just be honest. He's stealing this little boy's dinner, right? Like, Like have you ever had your lunch money stolen as a kid growing up? That's exactly what Andrew's proposing here. And we don't know anything about who this boy is or where he came from. You know, maybe his family sent him out with all the money they had left to go buy food for dinner. And he comes across this crowd and he stops by because he's curious about what's going on. Or maybe he'd heard stories about Jesus and he just wanted to know who this Jesus guy was. So so his family sends him out with a little bit of food that they had to go be with Jesus for the day. Either way, though, we know this about this boy's family. They were poor and they didn't have much at all. And here's Andrew, and he's trying to take the little bit that this boy does have. Like, like, like what's Andrew thinking? Well, we have to go back again to two weeks ago and understand the context of what Andrew would have known to be true about Jesus. He was there that day when Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. He'd seen Jesus provide a catch of fish larger than anything he'd seen in his life. He just went out on this mission trip with the other disciples and felt the power of God at work through him. And I think Andrew knew something in this moment that we all need to hang on to when it comes to giving hope away. Verse 18, Jesus said, bring them here to me. Bring the fish and the crackers to me. See, we may not feel like that we have a lot to offer. We may not feel like we have what it takes to be Jesus' plan A to give hope to the world. But Jesus isn't asking us to have all the answers or resources. He's simply asking us to bring what we have to him. I've heard it said this way, the small sacrifices lead to a miracle. When you give what you have, God can make a miracle. He can work with very little and turn it into something that no one could have ever imagined. And that's exactly what happens next. Verse 19, Jesus directed the people to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he gave thanks. And he broke the loaves. He gave, he gave it to the disciples and the disciples gave it to the people and they all ate and were what? Satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides the women and children. And that's where we think there might have been 20,000 people there that day. So when Andrew and this little boy bring his lunch to Jesus, what do we see Jesus do first? He prays, right? He looks to heaven and he thanks God for this little sacrifice that this little boy brought. He brought to Jesus a small amount of food, but it was everything he had. Remember, gratitude is the starting place for giving hope. And God is the source of all life and multiplication. And so Jesus breaks up this little boy's lunch and he starts sending it out with the disciples to give to the people. And out of these five crackers and two sardines, it says that the whole crowd ate and they were what? They were satisfied. Like this is the best meal they'd ever eaten. They likely never had this much food in a single meal. 
And there was more than enough left over. There were 12 baskets full left over after 20,000 people ate that day. So, so here's an interesting question. When did the food start to multiply? Did, did like fish and bread start raining down from heaven? I, I mean, that could have happened. It'd be weird if a fish hit you in the head or something like that. But I don't think that's how this happened because uh, Luke records in his version of the story that the disciples handed out the food and then Jesus kept giving them more. Jesus kept giving them more, meaning that as they took food to people and they started to run out, they had to keep going back to Jesus for more. And every time they went back to Jesus, Jesus gave them more to give away. The point of the story is this. When you give away what you have and you keep coming back to Jesus, he always gives you more to give. He always gives you more to give. So what do we do with this? Well, I want to think back to how this whole story started. Remember, Jesus is mourning his cousin's death. The disciples are tired from their mission trip, and they just want to get away. And these 20,000 people show up looking for Jesus, and he welcomes them in. He feels compassion for them. And then he challenges his disciples to feed the people, which was absolutely an impossible task, right? And then this little boy shows up with five crackers and a couple sardines, and he goes, I can help feed them. I mean, think about it. All, All over Scripture, Jesus tells us that if we want to enter in and experience his kingdom, we have to come to him with faith that's like the faith of a child. Kids don't have it together, do they? They don't have much to offer sometimes. They have more questions than answers, right? But man, kids have a boldness about them, don't they? Anytime we go to the store, our kids are always asking us to buy crap for them. They're asking for snacks and toys and video games. Like, it, it's nonstop. And, and our answer back to them is kind of an excuse. We're always like, uh, we don't have money for that. Sorry, we can't do it. Uh, one day, our daughter Jovi, she was at the store with my wife, and she called our bluff, and, and she pulls a quarter out of her pocket, and she goes, here, Mommy, I have money. This is enough. <laughs> it, it's like our kids believe that if they give us what they have, that as their parents, it'll be enough to provide whatever's needed, Right? And that's all that God, as as our Heavenly Father, is asking us to do as well. Even if what we have isn't enough to solve the problem. All he's asking us to do in every moment is just give what we have. Then trust that God will fill us up again. And then he'll do it again. And then he'll do it again. But here's the reality. Hope City, don't miss this. If we don't give what we have, we don't have a chance to see God do a miracle. All right? You, You know what the fastest animal in the world is? Many of us would say a cheetah, right? Uh, a, a cheetah can actually run up to 60 miles per hour, which is the equivalent of 16 body lengths per second. Uh, as a point of comparison, Usain Bolt, the fastest human on the planet, he, he can run 23 miles per hour or, or the equivalent of six body lengths per second. But the fastest animal in the world is actually a mite. And, and a mite is microscopic. It, I know it looks pretty gross, doesn't it? Uh, It's one of the smallest animals in existence. It can actually run 322 body lengths per second. So just as a point of comparison here, if Usain Bolt, a cheetah, and a mite are all the same size, and their racetrack is this bagel, the mite would win the race before Usain Bolt even made it a quarter of an inch around the bagel. The the point's this. You, You don't have to be big to make an impact. And in the kingdom of God, you don't have to have much to see God work in and through you with the little that you do have to offer to be his plan A to give hope to the world. You just have to bring the little that you do have to him and offer it to Jesus. Hey, here's the bottom line for today. Get a picture of this next slide. Jesus can do immeasurably more with the little that we have if we bring it to him. Jesus can do immeasurably more with the little we have, and that if is a big if, if we bring it to him. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 say it this way. Now to him who is able to do what? Immeasurably more. Like it can't even be measured, right? With the little that we have, or I'm sorry, immeasurably more, than all we ask or imagine, according to whose power? His power. Do you know what power that is? Uh, Romans says it's the same power that rose Jesus from the grave. That's at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. So here's the reality, Hope City. We actually don't have what it takes. We don't have what it takes to to be Jesus' plan A to give hope to the world. But Jesus does. And he can do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine if we bring it to him. So what's what's this look like practically? Well, the first thing that we have to do if if we're going to respond in this way is we have to lift up our eyes and see the need. 
When we trust Jesus to take care of us and those closest to us, we can actually start to see the needs of others around us. And just like Jesus felt compassion on the crowd that day, we can start to feel compassion for the people in our lives. And then we have to take a look at what God's given us. In this story, this little boy, all he had to offer were a few crackers and a couple sardines. It was never going to be enough for this crowd of 20,000. Yet his story and his legacy are recorded in Scripture forever. Why? Because he saw the need, he looked at what he had, and he offered it to Jesus. And then that's the last part. Bring what you have to Jesus in faith that he can do immeasurably more with it than you could on your own. Jesus has entrusted each of us with a few things. He's entrusted us with the time that we have here on this earth. He's given us all some talents or abilities. And he's entrusted us with like money or treasure. If you grew up in church, you might hear, have heard it, time, talent, and treasure. And maybe you look at your time and you're like, man, I don't have all day. But, but do you have 10 minutes that you could read to your kids at night? You, you might go, man, I don't have all day. But do you have five minutes that you could check in on a friend? Maybe you look at your time and you're like, I don't have time for a whole conversation. But, but do you have time to send that text message to someone you know needs to experience hope? Maybe you look at your abilities within like the church or the kingdom of God and you're like, Adam, I couldn't ever imagine like standing up and preaching a sermon. I could never do that. But could you help unload the trailer and help set up in here to create a great environment for other people to experience Jesus? You might look at your life and you're like, man, I want to make a difference in the next generation, but I know I can't change every kid in our community. But could you give an hour in city kids to help kids who come to Hope City know that God loves them and that they're valued by God and who they were created to be? Hey, you might look at your life and you're like, I can't hang out with kids. My own kids are driving me crazy. Like, there's no way I could do that. But can you open the door and could you welcome people in as they come in? And then maybe you look at your money. You might, you might say things like this, like, I can't give as much as required that, that matches what Jesus has given in my direction. You realize Jesus is actually, he's already given you everything. He, he gave his very life. There was nothing left that he could give you. But could you take the little bit that he has entrusted you with? And could you leverage it for the kingdom through this church called Hope City and trust that Jesus could do immeasurably more with the little bit that you offer than you could on your own? And can you trust that there will be plenty left over for you and your family? I, I want to close out this series with this story. Um, any baseball fans in here? You, you may know what this story is before I get into it, but one of the greatest moments in baseball history uh, wasn't a home run record. It wasn't the most strikeouts or anything like that. It, in fact, the, the game wasn't even like a remarkable game. On, on September 6, 1995, the Baltimore Orioles defeated the California Angels 4-2. But on that day, Cal Ripken Jr. played in his 2,131st consecutive game, breaking Lou Gehrig's record of 2,130 consecutive games played. And, and Cal Ripken received a standing ovation that went on for 22 minutes during this point in time. He, he circled the field and he was giving high fives to players and umpires and fans and, and, and uh, staff for those 22 minutes. But what made this moment memorable wasn't a single feeder achievement. It was the fact that Cal Ripken just showed up at work and he did his job for 14 years straight. He just showed up and he played the game. Even when he felt like he didn't have enough to offer, if he was sick or he didn't feel good or his, his ankles or knees weren't 100% or he was in a hitting slump or maybe he was tired from the night before, he simply showed up every day and he gave everything that he had to offer. And that turned into a moment that made history. Hope City, that's all Jesus is asking us to do every day too, is to show up and give him what we have to offer and be his plan A to bring hope to the world. We just show up and we be faithful. We bring all we have to him, and he can do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. And so we have a few goals as a church to end out this year. Uh, the first one's around generosity. As you take a look at your resources, what do you have to give? What do you have to offer to Jesus and trust that he could do immeasurably more with it than you could ever ask or imagine? We have a goal to raise $100,000 by the end of the year and here's why. We, we want to be able to give hope away to our community, uh, unlike we've ever been able to before. We want to help take care of moms with shared beginnings and provide hospital bags for those moms when they go to deliver a baby. Uh, we want to be able to uh, forward fund all of our outreach initiatives going into 2024. And we want to be able to have some money set aside for some opportunities that Jesus is giving us going into next year around staffing and buildings and things like that. So I just want to challenge you for a minute. 
What would it look like for you to give more than you planned on in December? What, what would it look like for you to look at what Jesus has given you? And even if it doesn't seem like much, just go, Jesus, this is all I have. But I'm going to offer it to you because I believe that you can do more with it than I could ever ask or imagine. And I want to be your plan A to bring hope to my community. All right, how about this? Who do you know that needs to experience hope? Invite them to Christmas next week. Uh, here, here's the reality. We can't change our friends' lives, can we? But Jesus can. And, and you never know what he may do over a one-hour experience next Sunday that may change their eternity. Do whatever you need to do to get them here. Bribe them with brunch. Tell them you're going to the game and then show up at Hope City. I'm just kidding. Don't do that, all right? <laughs> but grab some invite cards and invite them to, to get here. We're saying it this way. Everyone invite one. So take a risk and have a conversation and invite them this week. Or how about this, baptism? Do you trust Jesus with your life? You know, maybe you're sitting here today and you can feel Jesus doing something. And you're like, I don't know if I've ever really experienced this before, but Jesus, I want the life that you're offering to me. I want to trust you. And I've got some stuff going on in my life and I'm not sure how it's all going to work out. And I don't know that I believe like every part of the story yet, but Jesus, I, I at least believe enough that on a day in history, you went to the cross, you took on my sins and you rose from the grave to prove that it's true. If you believe that, then baptism is a great next step and Jesus can work out those other details with you as you walk with him. This is a moment to draw a line in the sand and say, hey, Jesus, I'm in. And man, if that's you, like we're ready for you. We've got, you might, maybe you didn't plan on this, but God had this date circled on the calendar for you. We've got shirts and shorts and towels available downstairs. Jared's in the back. You can go see him in these next two songs. We can get you downstairs and get you changed, and um, you can take that step to be baptized. I mean, think about that. The first Christmas you've ever celebrated that you actually believe that the story of God coming in our direction is true. That could be pretty cool. We're going to move into our time of prayer that we do around here every week, and I mean, we take communion every week. And this is just a tangible reminder that, that Jesus came to give all he had to bring hope into your life and into our world. And so I just want to leave us with this question as we close out. What, what's the little bit that Jesus has entrusted you with that he could do immeasurably more with it when you bring it to him? Is it around like your relationships and, and just inviting somebody to come next weekend? Is it serving and helping create a great environment for our friends and family on Christmas? Is it around finances and, and maybe you're not sure how it's going to add up, but you're like, Jesus, this is what I have and I'm going to trust you with it. Or is it around taking the next step and going, Jesus, I'm all in. I'm ready to be baptized. Whatever that looks like for you, I want you to process through that with Jesus and have that conversation with him in these next few minutes. If you need prayer for anything, we'll have a team right down front here that would love to pray with you. But let me pray for us and these next few minutes are yours. Uh, God, you're really good. And um, man, I know, I know this message is challenging today because um, it's challenging to me. But Jesus, you, you don't ask us to have all the answers or, or to work out the things that in our adult mind, sometimes we want to know like how the formula comes together or how, how things are going to work out down the line. Jesus, you ask us to come to you with the faith of a kid. It's just like, here's what I have. You're Jesus. You can do something with it. And I just pray, Jesus, that you would help each one of us in this moment to respond to you with faith like that, that you would show us what to do next, and that, Jesus, we would continue to be a community and a people. Who, who step into the calling to be your plan A to bring hope to the world. And trust, God, that you can do immeasurably more with all that we offer than we could ever ask or imagine. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen.